So hello, this video will serve as an introduction to a series of videos on history and the philosophy of history in the works of H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen King. So why these two writers? Well, frankly, it's because they're the ones I'm interested in right now and the ones I'm reading right now and the ones I'm thinking about right now. Yet I do think they pair together nicely on this theme of, of history. King, of course, was clearly influenced by Lovecraft as were many horror writers of, of his generation and the current generation. But he really developed a very different perspective on history. And I think the contrast between these two writers tells us a lot about the times they, le they live in, their own perspective on history, the themes their works explore, and then help crystallize and clarify the contribution of each of these writers. Now, by training, I am a historian. And... It struck me when I was actually reviewing Philip K. Dick's books a few years ago, and I'm currently podcasting on the works of Philip K. Dick, but I was re struck by what a clear vision of history he had in his work. And it also struck me that very few people had talked about it when I tried to go back and look at what other critics of, of Philip Dick and other people who've written on science fiction had to say about like Dick's philosophy of history, I found pretty much nothing. No one had anything really to say about it. Yet it seems to be there in almost all of his works, particularly in his vision of the frontier. Through much of his early career, he was obsessed with the idea of, of the frontier, and it saturates a lot of his early work. And his obsession with the frontier never really went away. What changes is his philosophy of what the frontier will mean to humans. I mean, the frontier remains in the geography of his works, pretty much until the end of his life. Um, and even one of his later works, The Divine Invasion, has this idea of the Savior coming from the frontier. Not This is really the opposite almost of the earlier works where humanity finds its salvation by going out to the frontier. And then in his middle career in the 60s, he wrote a lot of works like Martian Time Slip and The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, where the frontier is presented as very banal. It's very much like an extension of California suburbia, and it doesn't really offer much to human beings. But nevertheless, my point is that he had a concept of history that was really shaped by a vision of the frontier. Now, when I learned this about him, you know, I just found that I couldn't see other people talking about the relationship between this writer and 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 his own and his philosophy of history, despite all the things that have been written about about Philip K. Dick. And it, it's much the same way with with these other two writers, the ones I want to focus on in the series, H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen King. These two thinkers and writers are are of course linked for good reasons. Lovecraft's now, these two writers are obviously linked together very significantly. Uh, Stephen King, some of his earliest stories are very Lovecraftian in nature. I'm thinking of Jerusalem's Lot, one of his first stories. The idea of an external evil is certainly there in King. It is pretty much a Lovecraftian entity. And there, there are others. So Lovecraft is clearly in, in King's intellectual DNA. Yet he's not at all married to Lovecraft's view of history and view of, of the world. In fact, that's one of the places they really diverge quite significantly. Now, let's let's take f love, like one major issue with, with H.P. Lovecraft, and that's, of course, his racism. It's often been talked about and acknowledged, and I think there are very few people who don't, nowadays anyways, acknowledge that Lovecraft was a very odious racist with really horrendous ideas. But I've seen it addressed really in two ways. The first way this has been addressed is to say that his racism was simply that of his time and that he was a product of his time and therefore we really shouldn't blame him too much, right? Well, my response to this is, yeah, none of his ideas on race are very pioneering or original. And yes, he is a product of his time. He is a product of scientific racism. And when you read his letters, it's very clear where he gets a lot of his ideas on race from. He's pretty much open about this. Yet the fact remains there were non-racist and anti-racist active at the time. And his friends called him out on this. And there was plenty of room for Lovecraft to rethink his ideas based on evidence. And so to say he's just a product of the time, I think is a bit of a cop-out. 
the second thing, uh, the second kind of response I've, I've heard to this is, yeah, he was a racist, but it doesn't affect his work. Right. And, it, and sometimes this works. I, I think in the case of Richard Wagner, for instance, his his anti-Semitism is clearly out there. I mean, he wrote whole essays about about his anti-Semitism. So he didn't hide that at all. He was a very public part of his persona. But you can kind of li- you can listen to his operas and not see the anti-Semitism. And I know some people have kind of seen like this character, or that character, or this theme or that theme is anti-Semitic or just his embrace of kind of Norse mythology is by nature anti-Semitic. You know, I, I don't know. I, I just don't see it myself when I listen to Wagner's works. So I think you, in, in his case, it, it seems to me at least plausible you can make a distinction between the work and the artist. That's not at all the case with Lovecraft. And that's one thing I'll try to make clear in this video series. His racism is integral to all of his ideas and all of his characterizations and, you know, d- d- all the way down, really. Some of his earliest stories are very race-based. He's obs- He was obsessed with genealogy and heritage and legacy. He was obsessed with interracial sex he was obsessed with kind of racial purity his villains are almost always biracial or foreigners even like in works like at the moment of Mad- madness are they're framed as essentially race wars so let's i i just think that's rather ridiculous to say his racism is not really relevant to his work it, it's central to his worldview and it's and it comes from a certain view of history now, but that said, I, I mean, it's, I'm going to deal with his racism as much as I can in this, in this series, when I get to his stories and, and talk about some of his things. And it's not, th- it's something I don't want to shy away from. I, I think it's something we need to address and analyze seriously. Now, but for his broad view on history, though, Lovecraft's view of history is really cosmic and eternal, right? His villains tend to come from the sea or they're part of primordial cults or they're these ancient slumbering gods. Now, even as personal family history stories such as Rats in the Wall tend to deal with lost traditions that go back centuries or farther and therefore best defined as cosmic. I mean, the idea of you you kind of look through these old books and you find out this mystery of your past. This is something that this is a really Lovecraftian trope, right? This idea of that things have been forgotten and things are way deep in the past and buried. So that's all there in, in Lovecraft. But King, on the other hand, while he embraces many of Lovecraft's perspectives and points of view, certainly not on race, but on his kind of this idea of an external cosmic horror. And King is certainly willing to look at deep time. I mean, it is a great example of that. Black House has it. But although it's there, it's not as omnipresent as it is in Lovecraft's work. It's something that King plays with from time to time, but that's not really where his view of history or his philosophy of history is grounded. For him, history is much more on a human scale, right? So think of desperation in which, yeah, there's these ancient evil things that are kind of dug out of the past, but it's, they're kind of trapped in like mining communities, like mining ghost towns, which are very much in kind of human memory. Um, Certainly dairy is, yeah, you have an ancient evil, but it's very much grounded in the whole network of that society and that community, dairy. Um, anyways, what I'm trying to say here is that while Lovecraft speaks of lost knowledge hidden in ancient books, King will often just give us a Judd, Judd Crandall, someone who remembers. It. So evils are remembered much more commonly in, in King's fiction than in Lovecraft. So L- Lovecraft's more about forgetting and the need to forget and the virtue of forgetfulness. And King is much more on the necessity of remembering. And this is both connected to kind of very different views of history. Now, the series I'm going to be calling and the series I'm envisioning is going to be called The Old Stand Watch. Now, this is a quote from Pet Cemetery, and it's given very early in the story when Lewis Creed, I think after he first meets Judd Crandall, sees that he goes to bed very late. And he makes the comment like something like this. It's a paraphrase a little bit, but it's essentially The Old Stand Watch. This is something that King uses a lot, actually. It's certainly there in It. It's there in the Dark Tower with 
uh, Mother Abigail in a way. It's there in the Green Mile. And a few other works, too. Now, in it, of course, we have King's probably most rich historical tale where that takes this Lovecraftian premise of the ancient slumbering evil, slumbering and awakening evil, but it combines it with real historical evils, such as white supremacy and capitalism. And it's really grounded in the neighborhood. And it's something that people choose not to remember and, or something that can be remembered. So for Lovecraft, memory is very difficult and something that can be shied away from. And for King, it's something that's... that's it, my point, again, is just that history for King is much more human-scaled. So anyways, my point, what I'm trying to try to do here is, is just a, a tr attempt a very serious and systematic look at history in King's novels and stories and in Lovecraft stories and hope to reveal new perspectives on their works. So... I basically have four specific goals here that are going to frame the videos I'm going to make and the way I'm going to approach them. One is to locate and analyze thematically the historical references in these works. Now, what I'm not interested in is fact checking these writers. Um, you know, these are fantasy novels. They're, their historical facts aren't meant to be realistic, especially when you're talking about King and Lovecraft, where you have false histories being written and drawn up. So there's really no point in fact-checking it, but especially with King, there's a lot of interest in the past, and there's historical events are talked about and discussed, and a lot of his works are grounded in certain historical periods. He's very much a contemporary writer in the sense that he, he sets his novels in the time period where he writes them as often as, as not, but there's always kind of this reaching back to the past, or if not always, often. So there's a historical setting that that's one that we can reference right like the vietnam war maybe or world war one judd crandall talks about world war one so it's partially my goal will be to kind of give a taxonomy of these historical references so it's not about fact checking at all i don't really care if they get it right or wrong or if you know some interpretations are wrong or outdated it doesn't matter but rather, I want to understand how particular historical references enhance our experience of reading these texts. And I, I think a really good example of this is, is Pet Cemetery, in which you have this, of course, the villain of that story is a, is a Wendigo. But the whole setting of the Wendigo is a land conflict between the Micmacs and the state of Maine and the historical fact that this land was stolen, right? That's a real world historical reference point that gives context to the novel. So that's my first point, is really just to find these historical references that reference our world. A second goal will be to look at the general philosophy of history and change over time in these writers. And I've already kind of established it in broad outlines, at least as a hypothesis at this point, that Lovecraft is looking at cosmic history in cosmic time, and King is grounding his historical time in people. And I think it's important that that's why It awakens every 27 years and Cthulhu awakens, you know, once every million years or something, right? It's, it grounds it much more in our lived experiences. And so King's much more interested in our, our sins and our evils and the things that we carry with us day to day, year in, year out in our world, right? So like even in The Shining, right? Like a man going off the wagon seems very minor and it's not the kind of thing Lovecraft would care to even think about or concern himself with. Okay, a third, I guess, perspective, and this will be more certainly important with Lovecraft, but I think I could see some things we could say about this with King as well, and that is to flesh out the historical context of the authors and their influences and where, you know, how the historical world they lived in affected them. So for instance, for Lovecraft, it's certainly going to be World War I. It's going to be the kind of the culture wars of the 1920s, to a certain degree, the rise of fascism and militarism in the 1930s, scientific racism, um, those kinds of things. And I have all of Lovecraft's letters, which we can look at and reference in comparison to his works to try to get some idea of, of how he's seen about his place in time. With King, of course, the central event would have to be like, would be some of those of the 60s, the Vietnam War, if you think of like Hearts in Atlantis. And, and so anyways, let's just, it's about trying to understand the historical context of these writers. 
And the fourth approach would be then to go to the fictional histories, detail the fictional histories, point out continuities and relationships and talk about their relationship with real events if they exist. So for instance, we can take a look at something like the main legion of white decency, which is a kind of a subplot in it. But we can put this into the context and compare it to real white supremacist groups that were active in the American North in the mid 20th century, which there were some. So yes, the main legion of white decency is, in, is invented, but it's essentially a parallel to a northern branch of the Ku Klux Klan. So those, again, those are again my four goals here is to try to find these historical references in the works and just mention them and get them out there and, and think about their importance for the work within the work to flesh out the historical context of of these authors to f talk about their general philosophy of history and then finally to look at their fictional histories right and I of course Lovecraft has some doozies but uh, King does as well so that's the overall goals of this series all right so what works will I look at um, it, again, it won't be all of them. It will be quite a lot of them. I think there's very few works by either of these writers that we could fully neglect. Um, and King, of course, has written at least one work of nonfiction, which I think we can one work of nonfiction, which I think we can essentially call historical. And that's Dance Macabre, which is a history of the horror genre. But even though it's quasi autobiographical, it's essentially a history of the horror genre during his lifetime. So there's, I'm just looking at my bookshelf here, and I don't think there are that many works that I would, could ignore entirely. But maybe a few that I might have, I might have to squint a little bit too hard to, to comment on much. With Lovecraft, it's a little bit easier because he himself is much more of a historical figure than than King is, you know, King's still with us and still writing. So, you know, that's, that's a bit of a limitation. But anyways, again, my goal is to try to get at the philosophy of history revealed in these works. Not to say that these guys are philosophers of history by any stretch of the imagination, but they, they have a certain way of looking at the past. And I think this can help illuminate how we, and maybe help us appreciate these works in new ways. And that, that's my modest goal. So anyways, thank you for watching this introductory video, and I'll be back shortly with some other 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 videos. I don't know where I'm going to start with. I could start with Carrie. I might very well start with something like Dagon or some other Lovecraft work, but we'll we'll see. Um, I'm I'll I'll look around and I'll I'll, I'll think think this through of, of which um, which work I want to start with. I might just start with Carrie and see how it goes. So again, thanks for watching and, and I'll see you see you soon.